Welcome to the Data Leadership Lessons Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony J. Algman. Data is everywhere in our businesses, and it takes leadership to make the most of it. We bring you the people, stories, and lessons to help you become a data leader. Today, we welcome Evan Komak. Evan is the CEO of Finn, a company shaping the future of work. Fin Analytics is a cloud-based comprehensive measurement platform for operations that helps leaders drive efficiency and reduce operating expenditures through data-driven process improvements. Prior to Fin, Evan was a general manager at Twilio, the fastest growing SaaS company in the history by revenue. Evan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. So um, why don't we, and, and we do this with all of our first time guests, but why don't you just take a, a minute or two and give us a little bit more of your career story personally and how you ended up doing what you do now at Finn. And then we'll, we'll talk more about Finn and, and, and learn more about what, uh, what you guys are doing in that space. Yeah, totally. Uh, so I actually came, I'm from New Zealand originally. I came to Silicon Valley in 2011 with nothing much more than a, uh, a suitcase and a dream. I really came out with just with the idea that I'd always wanted to work in the technology industry, always wanted to build software and always wanted to be in Silicon Valley, even before I kind of knew where that was geographically, to be honest. And within a few weeks of arriving in San Francisco, I had talked to uh, some of the companies I really had been admiring as they grew companies like Heroku and Dropbox and Twilio uh, and ended up with a few job offers. I chose Twilio mostly based on, the product itself, I'd been playing with the product and I just thought it was incredible and magical. And uh, started there actually, um, at the same time as a couple of other folks, we we essentially started the the enterprise sales team all in one go with a sales leader and an inside salesperson and enterprise sales and channel sales. And then myself who started the sales engineering team and built that team out over the course of about five years. And Twilio started to become a very serious large company and was had IPO prospects and all this type of thing and kind of sunk into me that uh, whilst this was very fun and the growth was amazing that I had originally come out to Silicon Valley to, to build product and build software. And so I uh, took a little bit of a, a detour and went back into product management, hmm. um, built various products at Twilio over, over a period of five years and ended up as the general manager of a group there, which was... Um, called IoT and wireless, and basically we were targeting uh, cellular connectivity for um, device makers. The, the most obvious example of success I think that we had in that time was, um, you know, Lime scooters. All the Lime scooters around the world were using our connectivity infrastructure. We also had other customers building wearables and um, other types of connected devices too. That's really interesting. So, how what led you to moving on from Twilio and and ending up at, at Finn in, in a whole new startup. Yeah. Um, it, it was an interesting process. And, and honestly, I, it, a lot of it came down to, I was feeling a little comfortable in some, in some ways, but um, you know, Twilio was doing amazingly, continues to do amazingly, even at the scale that it's at, it's still growing just unbelievably. Um, it, I was approached by a venture capital firm uh, who was hiring for a CEO role for this company, Finn. And Finn is just a really interesting company for a number of reasons. The technology is interesting. The vision is interesting, but the company background is also super interesting. And that might be a good place to start actually describing what Finn is. Yeah. So Finn was um, started by two consumer technology uh, folks who, who, who had really great backgrounds. Uh, Sam Lesson was the first product leader at Facebook, very, very early at Facebook and was there for a very long time. And Andrew Cortina actually was a co-founder of Venmo. And so uh, listeners of yours in the United States are probably familiar with Venmo, but if you're not, it's, I, I would guess, the largest peer-to-peer -peer payments application in the United States, now owned by PayPal, um, very successful. So these two guys got together and they started this consumer startup. And the consumer startup was, uh, it was called Finn Assistant or just Finn. And it was really like a um, an AI-enhanced uh, personal assistant product. Mm -hmm. And so they ended up with hundreds of agents working for them. And these are these are two people who come from consumer software where everything is instrumentable, everything is metrics based, mm -hmm. everything is based on optimizations and A-B testing and small tweaks, but all of that requires you to have good data, good analytics. And what they found is they had all these hundreds of human beings that were 
completing tasks for their customers and really no idea what anyone was actually doing to use their words in terms of which tasks take the longest, what's the best way to perform a certain task, how should we be training people, what tools should they be using, but even right down to things like how does someone's home Wi-Fi connection speed impact their ability to get a certain task done in a certain amount of time. And so they essentially built an in-house product. And it's a, what it was is a, a tool that was capable of capturing a human interaction that was happening inside a web browser. And this is relevant now because essentially all the tools we use to get our work done all day, every day are in the browser. Mm -hmm. And it uh, takes metadata and data about those human interactions, sends it to the cloud. And then in the cloud, we apply these kind of big data analysis techniques. And we do that so that we can surface um, unobvious insights about how certain patterns in human behavior and human interaction with software result in different business outcomes or uh, different um, cost outcomes or just different outcomes. And, and it's kind of up to you, honestly, as a customer to, to tell us what the outcomes are, or tell the system what the outcomes are that you're looking for. But it's really about uh, taking these many, many millions of hours of human software interaction that happen inside businesses every single day, quantifying it, and then allowing us to query that as data. Hmm. So is your is your target market then um, the like uh, phone support for customer organizations or is it something beyond that? It's that's a it's a very good way of phrasing that question for a particular reason, which is a lot of our early customer adoption has been customer experience teams, and and oftentimes it's not phone support as such. It might be you know chat support or email or even like inside sales. But you're correct. Early adoption of the product has skewed towards teams that are interfacing with customers. I like to think that one predictor of the level of value that Finn can provide for you today is how big is your team and how similar is the work that they're doing to one another. And the sort of bigger the score on each of those two vectors, the more value you're going to get relatively out of Finn. Hmm. But the technology that we've built, like it doesn't dictate that necessarily. Um, you, you could definitely use it to, for, for all kinds of more interesting queries. It's just, it's just that that happens to be a place where people already know what their pain points are. They struggle to demonstrate their return on investment today. Uh, they're already looking for tools to quantify. But yeah. we, we see customers now in places like accounts receivable, accounts payable, uh, record, you know, digital, um, what do you call it? Data entry. Mm. You know, any, anywhere where there's a relatively time-consuming human task. And I think that there's a reason that we see that early on, but that's that's certainly not our vision. And I think our vision extends uh, quite far beyond that into uh, much more creative knowledge work. I, I was saying to, to one of my colleagues actually a few minutes ago, I'd love to know how my behaviors throughout the day compare to that of successful or the most successful series a company ceos mm -hmm. like can you could 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 some system tell me you don't spend enough time with customers or whatever it is like are there ways to draw um data about like very highly creative roles and compare those against benchmarks and other things and i think um that that's an interesting path for us so I, I I could see that. I mean, I, I you've got my wheels turning in terms of the kinds of things that I interact with a, a lot of the time. Like my I've spent a long time in in consulting, um, but more recently I'm now a a manager in in a large organization, and I'm constantly inundated with process of varying degrees of inefficiency, and I could think. Almost everywhere, all day long, everything I do could be benefited from this. I'm like, there's so much that, you know, is it's it's like half of my job is understanding how to route the right work to the right place with the right variables associated with it. And then, you know, achieving some sort of outcome that then has a material impact on a group of people. And and that pattern right. at its most basic level, I think, is is kind of everywhere, both inside and outside our businesses. And I and I like the 
the thought around things like accounts receivable and accounts payable, because that's almost in, indistinguishable from a end customer support type of function because you are constantly working. Granted, it's business to business, but it's the same kind of there's a transaction involved and there's um, you know some degree of um, uncertainty about the uh, conclusion or um, unknowns about what's happening at any given time. You have to kind of unravel some of that. But that pattern, I would imagine, is, is very similar across those things. And so you can learn. I'm curious, because obviously this is is, is very much AI driven. So there's a lot of fancy uh you know computational code and things happening in the background and you're and you're you're running big algorithms and, and things like that. How transferable between these different slices of functionality is the the AI? Because in my mind when I see like artificial intelligence, I'm like, well that to me is basically turning over the code to a machine and I can't read that code anymore. All I can do is kind of look around what's happening and observe what it's making those connections on my behalf. Is that, I don't uh, know if yeah, that's a I fair mean, ass assessment or not. It, it is and it isn't. I mean, so for certain things that we want to achieve, it is a fair assessment. I think um, in cases where you start with an outcome and then you want to figure out like what, what series of, actions were more or less likely to arrive at that outcome, then you want to use uh, machine learning models, for example, to do that. Mm -hmm. There are other cases though. So where what we're doing is actually just very discrete data analysis. So for example, um, if you have a certain process that has a discrete um, beginning state and a discrete ending state. So for example, like a customer support ticket has a very discrete beginning and end state. It starts when it's submitted in it. Um, uh, ends when when the when it's marked as result, and so within a discrete state like that, uh, we can actually just show you the variations of what occurred. So, for example, I was talking to a customer yesterday, and we came to the conclusion that one of the reasons that a certain type of task, I can't remember if it was like a refund or something like that, was taking longer to be performed in certain markets versus other markets, uh, was the quality of the translation software that had been provided to the agents. And so what we saw was that agents in this certain market were actually going out and using Google Translate instead. Mm. And so that was adding a lot of time to the transaction. Uh, it was also, um, you know, arguably resulting in maybe data being shared places where it shouldn't be shared, but you actually don't really need AI to go from, you know, okay, here's the start state, here's the end state, show me all of the journeys that happened in between and which of those journeys uh, was the optimal journey as in, um, took the least amount of time, uh, potentially resulted in the best outcome, uh, and show me the outliers as well. And once you start looking at the outliers, then you can zoom in on those and see like very interesting things going on, uh, whether people are consulting the knowledge base too often, or um, whether it relates to some technological problem, like a, a page is freezing all the time, or people have to fill in the same form three different times because of the validation rules. There's all these kinds of things that you can see once you zoom in um, on how a certain process is being executed. And I, I want to, so I don't want to filibuster you, but like, <laughs> uh, it is interesting that you mentioned processes because I think there's, when we start talking about this type of pattern of technological adoption, people's minds immediately jump to sort of this idea of managing humans, making them more efficient. Um, and maybe it feels a little punitive. The real value, though, actually is is in understanding process, to your point. And a lot of our customers won't even configure the system in such a way where they can zoom into individuals. They just want to know across an entire team, uh, what's the best way to do something? How should we be training everyone to do this? Or what are the common points of failure? What's a what's a precondition that's likely to result in this taking far too much time? And, you know, for those things, it really is all about process. We sort of think about the process is being at the center. And then there are various actors who are involved in executing a process. There's humans, um, there's technology, and then there's the people who actually define how the process should be carried out. And we want to help you to understand how all those things come together, basically. Um, first of all, to be able to actually know what's going on, which is surprisingly a challenge for a lot of companies. Well, actually, maybe not so surprising at this point in time. Uh, and then to figure out like how you might want to change those things. So when when you're working with say you're working with a new a new customer, sure, and they have a business which I would imagine like many businesses, there's a lot of opportunities to go in and and apply this. 
do you come in and I have two questions. One is, do you come in and try to bring Finn across the board and address all of them? Or do you do like a, a bit more of a, a targeted area, land and expand approach where you, you start in one area, prove it out and, and go from there? And then secondly, do you use only the customer knowledge that you like do you start by doing a bunch of data research and, and analytics specifically for that customer or are you able to leverage the collective knowledge that you've gained from other customers obviously controlling for privacy this is not a question around like the privacy or the specifics details but are you able to identify patterns and adopt them to new clients as well or do you have to keep that totally separate per client right yeah no, i mean first and foremost um when you start dealing with this type of data, privacy is a, a huge issue. And, um, you know, we're very fortunate. One of our early employees, um, this guy named Michael Richter, who was previously chief privacy officer at Facebook. And we, we put a ton of, a ton of effort into privacy from very, very early on. Uh, that was actually one of the things that really impressed me when I started interviewing with the company, because for a small company, we already had these various legal compliances around data security and all this other stuff. So that, that was great. Um, to answer your question, like we do allow customers to opt in or opt out out of uh, uh, providing pre-aggregated, pre-processed um, outcome data to industry benchmarks. So for for example, like you could take something that's very pre-processed, like mean time to resolution or um, um, uh, first touch resolution or some of these statistics that are, they require a lot of aggregation to go into them and just sort of knowing the number doesn't tell you a lot, but we can, we can show you or allow you to opt in to be, to see that against a benchmark from, from an industry. Um, but to, to the first part of your question, if I remember correctly, when we go into uh, a new client, um, the tool will do quite a bit out of the box. We, we do need to understand a few basic things like, um, the, the structure of your team and, um, what, you, you know, those, those sort of start and end points as it relates to different units of work. But once we understand that, we can start showing you pretty quickly um, some pretty interesting data. And as a customer, you have the ability to kind of slice and dice how you see the data as well. It's not necessarily all completely pre-processed into um, reports. You can sort of post facto generate new things that you didn't know you wanted to know about. Hmm. So, um, you, you know, to, to that point, um, Customers will oftentimes have like some, like some problem. Uh, you know, they want to increase uh, NPS, Net Promoter Score, but and they know what their score is, and they have all these great tools for collecting it, but they're not exactly sure what the behaviors of a of a human employee are that are more likely or less likely to contribute to that. So they may have a something in their head like that. Mm -hmm. um, we do try and work on a team by team basis. There's not a lot of value in deploying. Well, there's not a lot of like incremental value that comes from deploying with two two teams simultaneously if they're doing very different work. There's value for both teams, but the additional value of doing them together is not um, typically super super multiplying, let's say. So, but within one team, what we do see is that there's a lot of value in deploying to every single person. Um, one of the sort of things that we find ourselves saying a lot is that a very popular or um, a, a strong alternative or not a strong alternative, but a common alternative to thin is approximation. And it's approximation through sampling and, uh, and taking those samples and extrapolating out from the samples. And so one of the, the I think the major um, benefits of thin is especially for teams that are already quite well oiled, which a lot of customers aren't, but you know, some teams are quite well oiled already. They'll always find new things by looking at the entire population looking at every piece of work that's done um, and they'll, they'll, you know, figure out where those outliers are and what's, what's causing them. So one team at a time, I think, you know, that's, that's a pretty common pattern for us, but we do like to be across every seat just so we can get that like big full picture of the data basically. So let's, let's drill in a little bit further. Cause we do have an audience that ranges from you know, entrepreneurs and the business leadership side to much more technical people. And I'm just curious from a, a technical stack perspective, 
is Finn fundamentally a software as a service? Is this something that we then deploy in our cloud environments? Or, or I, I imagine that there's updates and things like that. But you can talk. Can you talk to me a little bit about the that that technology stack that you're working with and what it looks like from an integration perspective uh, on the yeah. client side? Yeah, totally. So, I mean, on the client side, it's it's a browser extension, and the reason for that is, you know, you think about a lot of popular analytics products. Google Analytics, Heap Analytics, Mixpanel. These are these are kind of like product analytics. It's it's the idea is I'm the one building the product, and I want to know how all these various users are using my product. Um, Finn is sort of flipped on its head from that. It's these are all my users. They all work for me. They are all employed by me, or we're all part of the same team, and they're using a whole bunch of different products that I don't actually control. They're using Salesforce and Zendesk and Google Docs and Slack and all these products that actually I didn't build myself. And so the way that we do that is by integrating with the browser, we can understand all the interactions that are happening throughout the day. Uh, and the browser interact the browser integration is fairly lightweight in the sense that um, the analysis logic is not, for the most part, happening in the browser. The browser n understands... Um, various rules as to when it should be turned on or turned off and actually we allow the the user to turn it on and off as well but you know it's it's the the, the extension understands when it should or shouldn't be collecting interaction data and to what level of interaction data it should be collecting and what specific things it might be looking for it's really just can like sort of site configuration data uh, but other than that it doesn't really do a lot it just uh passes passes data to the cloud where the where the intelligence um really lives and then you know our back end stack is um, fairly, fairly standard in, in terms of um, how, how we've built it, the open source components and various things that we use. It is, a, it is provided as a service. We run the service. The exception to that is we do collect, in some cases, um, depending on the customer and, and what they're looking for, we do collect some very sensitive data. So for example, we do have the ability to um, record the screen if that's something that you want to do. And you can turn that on and off conditionally based on what's going on. Maybe you're trying to debug a software issue that's just very hard to find. And so you want to turn that video recording on in certain conditions. Uh, and when we do that, we do um, have different options as to where that data is stored. You can store that data on premise if you like. We, we essentially um, ask the customer for an Amazon S3 bucket, but that could well just be an Amazon S3 bucket compatible storage system that you run somewhere. Uh, and so we do understand that some of that data is uh, of, a, of a certain level of sensitivity that even if we're following bulletproof security practices, folks may, may wish to keep that under their own control. Right. So let me see if I can paraphrase this correctly, because I think if I understood you correctly, I, I think this is very interesting because um, you know, most of our interactions with our workforce are happening through browser browser based means um, to facilitate the various work. Um, and you're then saying instead of going and creating independent like API integrations to every interface that they have, you are actually going and pulling from the browser. And I assume you, you have to do some some custom work for different kinds of applications if they're using Salesforce in one place or if they're using some sort of homegrown tool or something like that somewhere else. But as long as it's coming through a web page, you are able to kind of hook into that judiciously as, as per the scope of what you're doing and then bring the data in and then analyze it using your methods and then be able to, to serve back out also through a web interface to uh, the people that are using the insights and, and the, the analysis. Correct. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a slight nuance to that, which is, um, you know, dealing with front ends of, of actually before this call, you were just mentioning that Google had changed the Google meet interface. Right. And so sometimes large vendors, you know, make changes to browser based applications. And we have ways that we, we look at that and try and get ahead of it. But, um, some of the major applications that customers are using all the time. So things like Salesforce and Zendesk are very, very common for us. Um, we do actually integrate against their APIs as well. Uh, there's certain data that we take from the API that's um, more reliable and 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 arguably easier to get at than trying to get it through the browser. But um, but the browser can do interesting things. Like it can tell you, for example, um, when pages don't load or the fact that a certain page is loading very slowly and that's slowing your team down. These are things that you can't get anywhere else. 
the other advantage of doing things through the browser is you can understand things like um uh I, maybe there's certain typing events that are gonna slow down the way that someone's solving a problem and you know going through the api all you get is the the picture of the solved problem you don't actually know what was involved in in, in getting it to be solved there's one other major advantage which is most most enterprises i would say are now at a point where they are if not 100 percent in the browser they're pretty much 100 percent in the browser maybe there's one application that's a laggard or something like that but they're pretty much in the browser and oftentimes they'll have some internal tool that they've built um that's part of a workflow right so maybe customer put sends a ticket into zendesk requesting a refund that's what kicks off the work we understand what queue it was on etc cetera, etc cetera. Maybe the refund ends when a certain form is submitted in NetSuite, let's say, but maybe on the way there, there's some in-house CRM or some in-house usage system or something that the agent is going to go and view. And um, by working through the browser, it means uh, we basically can allow you as the developer of that application to very easily um, make sure that it's sort of thin aware or that thin is aware of it and how it works and what you might want to get from that application um, without doing uh, a ton of custom API integration we do we do have REST APIs and and that you can pump data into from maybe certain systems that are headless or don't don't have a a user interface or maybe there's some action that happens you know maybe a customer closes a ticket without your agent ever being involved through the browser and you want to still uh, close that event but um, yeah there's a there's a big benefit to going to going through the browser and that's that's actually what really enables this product and this paradigm to exist mm -hmm. uh, this. There has been a lot of companies that have tried to do things similar to this in the past with um, concepts like, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, like visual AI, sort of like watching the screen and trying to, and, and trying to understand what's going on yeah. as someone uses a desktop application. It's just very hard. It's very brittle. With going to the browser all of a sudden, every application has this declarative user interface that's introspectable. Uh, and so it, it makes building what we're building all of a sudden quite a lot more feasible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is really clever. <laughs> I, I like this because I'm thinking about it, like I'm, my technical wheels are starting to turn. And, and sometimes it's nice to be able to do that when I, I rarely seem to get to do code level stuff anymore. But I think about like how you could have because you get the persistence of, you know, what browser, what user has this, and you can kind of see what they're doing through the different steps of their process. And then you can start to understand this is what the process usually looks like. And because you're watching it in real time as it happens, you get the benefit of quantifying the time it takes for certain steps. And like, just because you're present and watching it the way you are, it really gives you a richness of available insights to that process that very few alternatives would have. I, I'm, I'm, I find this yeah. very interesting. Yeah. I mean, you basically have the same field of vision as the user. So, right. like, if you know, and and so, like, one example, like, I was on a, a Google Meet call a few minutes ago, and I was on a different computer, and I couldn't get the camera to work, and I was thinking, it'd be really interesting to correlate, you know, the Google Meet user interface with, like, say deals closing in Salesforce and say, you know, does a salesperson close more deals if they are more likely to have their video on when they're talking to customers or something like there's just all kind like everything really happens in the browser. And so you can really start to imagine, okay, I'm going to correlate data that, um, well, first of all, we may not have thought of correlating before, but secondarily, we may not even know to correlate it yet. Like we might've been collecting it without knowing that there's some, that there's some value in in collecting it, but mm -hmm. uh, but being able to go back and look over it in different ways uh, is very interesting. So that that brings up because obviously this is where machine learning comes in, and and you really start to try to find new. Uh, connections between data that you wouldn't even be looking for um, until the machine says, "Hey, you know, this there's something here. You might want to dig into that that further." How do you manage, um, you know, and at, at kind of a, a metadata level, how do you manage keeping all of this straight? Because I imagine there's there's some pretty rapid growth in data volumes that you're contending with in your in your stack especially if you're doing so as in a, a service model where you're doing this across many different customers 
you probably have to scale this up pretty quickly. And then I imagine there's both the machine learning component to identifying those connections, as well as an opportunity for either folks in your organization or your clients to kind of investigate and interrogate that data further uh, through their own uh, manual analysis. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, there's so much in, in, to unpack in what you just said. It's all very spot on. Um, so first things first, yeah, data, the data volume is growing pretty quickly. We are hiring. Um, so <laughs> if it, that would be like the only thing I'd want to say about that. I mean, it's a very hard challenge. We are hiring as quickly as we can. Great data people, um, please, uh, fin.com slash jobs. But even just email me, uh, EC echo Charlie at fin.com because hiring is, is definitely a top priority. Um, you know, you mentioned, uh, I mean, I guess one of the things that like limits the data volume a little bit is we do have a very strong view towards privacy and also just sort of effectiveness. There's a whole bunch of data you could ma imagine us collecting that would be very hard to think would ever be useful. Mm -hmm. So, and maybe that's the wrong approach. I, it's not necessarily that we're fixed into that approach, but, um, you know, we do configure the data that we're trying to collect and, and some of that is just to, to limit noise and then others it's for privacy and, and other reasons as well. Um, so that, that would be sort of one thing. Um, what, what was the, the last thing you mentioned? I, there was something really interesting in there. Just around um, both gaining the insights from the machine learning side of things, as well as uh, enabling uh, yeah. yourselves or, or your clients to interrogate further right. manually. Yeah. So, so one thing that, and actually like going back to hiring, if anyone has a strong opinion on how to solve this, I'd love to hire them. I think there's a weak spot in the ecosystem right now for data products around, because I agree with you, I'd love to be able to give the data in a very raw format to customers and just say, Hey, like, you know, use your, um, Python notebooks or load this into your data pipelines, whatever it is, and do some analysis on it. And we do expose, um, rest APIs, for example, but anyone who's ever tried to download massive data sets through a rest API knows that it's, um, it's a fairly sort of cumbersome process. We do have some customers doing that today. It's, it's not unthinkable, but it's, you know, it, it does maybe limit the scope of what we would want to expose. I know that Snowflake has, for example, Snowflake Marketplace, but I'm not sure that that's the exact solution to this problem. I think like there's, there needs to be something like REST, um, but for sharing these large data sets between trusted partners. And maybe I'm just missing something, but um, you know, I think we've toyed with the idea of just giving customers a SQL connection string, for example, and partitioning data out onto a certain data warehouse that only belongs to them and letting them run with it. Um, and that's, that's something we're exploring, but, but it, you know, I think there's a bigger solution to this problem where you have like different data sources provided by different vendors and you can, um, pull them in and mix them in different places. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's something that I, I definitely want to think about how we solve. Yeah. And, and that's interesting. And, and I can tell you from my own experience as well, is that I don't think we have that full solution yet that the rest equivalent for data, I haven't seen it if it exists out there. And, and you know, it also, you know, it, it, it exposes a challenge or a limitation in, in software as a service offerings um, kind of entirely is that you want clients to be able to have unfettered access to their data. Like you, you want them to be able to do that analysis, but the logistics of making that possible are challenging. And, you know, for a long time, I always said, you know, if, if the data is being held by the vendor, you know, that's that's a deal breaker because I want to be able to have unfettered access to it when I'm sitting on the client side. But then right. I also have worked in more than one client when I was in consulting that wouldn't have been able to do anything with that data if they had it. And so it's it's yeah. also this, you know, I think your your point is actually very well taken around. There is a lot of data that has a very low likelihood of being useful. Like you can track every click event in a web browser, but does it really give you every, like, does that help you further? I, I spend actually, there's a, there's an analogy here that I'm actually kind of, I haven't wrapped my head around why. And so many of our, our listeners are, are early adopters to technology and I'm sure not, um, 
a significant a number of them have heard of um, the Tesla move uh, in terms of their automated driving away from radar driven systems to now going full on vision. They've they've abandoned what was an enormous source of data that they could use in lieu of refocusing on purely a vision based autonomous driving type of mentality. And, and I just see this parallel there is like, is there in this world of basically unlimited data, some data that just isn't worth the trouble? Is that what you, is that what we're seeing now? Just kind of broadly, this isn't Finn specific, well, but I, this is just kind of in the space. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, until you know, it's important, maybe, I, I guess it comes down to the, you know, there's a, there's a formula that you could write up which relates to like the cost of storage versus the potential future value. And a good example for us would be like cursor movement data. Mm -hmm. We don't track where the cursor moves around the screen. Like, we could, there's some JavaScript libraries out there that that's all they do. And they allow you to replay customer sessions on your website. Now, if some customer came to us and said, we're experiencing this issue where we think like agents are spending a long time, like trying to figure out where to click on this page, then, okay, sure. We could go and sample that on that page and that may allow us to get to an answer. But you know, broadly speaking for us, that data and the cost of storing it versus the perceived future you know, potential value, mm -hmm. probably that equation just doesn't work out. But I, I think you could say the same thing about like, you know, in the 90s, people didn't store log data. There was, you know, people had log retention policies where you would clear your logs after every two weeks. And now, now because of the cost equation having changed so much, like that's unthinkable. You, you know, you want to store your logs forever for security reasons and um, for whatever other reasons, troubleshooting reasons and whatever else. So I think, you know, as that as that hardware and just general capacity curve you know, keeps coming down, then then more types of data become uh, the outcome of that equation basically goes above zero. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I mean, I, the Tesla thing is super interesting because I, I know very little about that space, but there is one thing that I do know, which is that you can learn to drive by looking at things because I've done it myself. Mm -hmm. And so you know, like whether or not it's a better system than the LiDAR system, I don't know. But I do know that it is possible to drive, learn to drive by solely by looking at things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I spend I spend more time, more mental energy than I should considering that whole dynamic because I'm like, you could be better than people in theory, but in practice, be, there's a limit to how good you can drive a car. Right. And like, that's the, the other thing is that there is not an infinite limit to the potential for automated driving, because right. once you get to perfect safety or, or safety of you, the best driver could do this at the same level, you're not going to exceed that. You're not going to become such a good driver that you can make the car fly. It, like there's a, there's a limit to that. Right. So I think that it's, 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 trying to overlay pragmatism in our data work and and kind of to your earlier point where that equation of what's reasonable changes over time i generally personally like to capture more data than i think is too like you know that is likely going to be needed until it becomes more expensive than I'd like to pay. Like if it's right. something that's $10 a month, I'm going to take that all day. I don't care. Even if the the small chance, the lottery-like odds of this could be really valuable someday, that's worth doing. If it's something that is going to cost a million dollars a month and has a very low likelihood of succeeding and a very marginal return if it does, then you're going to be much less inclined to, to hold on to it. Yeah, I agreed. So does Finn, so from where the if Finn vision started to where you are today, how has the organization evolved? And do you still have hundreds of people doing the assistant business or has it completely moved now to all the um, AI and, and the software as a service model? Yeah. So we, the Finn assistant business is, is no, does no longer exist. What essentially happened is, um, you know, Sam and Andrew, who I mentioned earlier, they start they they were building the assistant. They started building this back end software product, and we had very strong uh, attention from from some of um, the fastest growing companies in the world. I, I think you know, last year we were very fortunate to work with a lot of very public software IPO companies. For example, a lot of unicorns. There's a lot of kind of operationally heavy software startups in the world now that they didn't exist before people who are hmm. solving 
problems in the real world, but but using cloud software and there tends to be a strong operational component to that. So basically the demand for the product was just there. And so we jumped on it and, and uh, pivoted the company uh, sometime middle to late of last year, went on kind of a hiring spree and, and that's where I joined. And we added a team of fairly seasoned uh, B2B um, experts cross-functionally. So hired you know, a marketing leader from a company called Cooper, hired a sales leader from LinkedIn, hired an engineering leader from Instacart. So we added a lot of these folks who had, who had uh, done this before in some shape or form. And so the company now is looks much more like a traditional B2B mm-hmm. uh, SaaS software company. Um, yeah, raise, raise some money and we're basically just running full speed at this problem now. Cool. And, and and I think that's very common in most startup organizations is that you you find some great insights, make a pivot, and then accelerate. And so while we still have a couple minutes, I kind of just want to turn it back towards you as an individual um, and understand, you know, you're, you're sitting in a chair that I think a lot of folks would aspire to sit in one day as a CEO of, a, of, of in startups and, and, and that. And I'm kind of there's a couple questions that I have um, related to that. If you just kind of talk yeah, to them yeah. as you like it, it, you know, the first is, is what unique skills or what particular things should a person who wants to be, you know, in this kind of role, if not a CEO, but, but a, a senior leader in, in a, in a fast growing organization um, in the technology space, like what are the particular kinds of skills that they should be developing and, and what kinds of things should they be doing the experience they should be getting in their career to, to hopefully have that kind of opportunity. And then two, once you do have that kind of opportunity, like, I just love to hear like some lessons that you've learned along the way from these, these awesome organizations you've had privileges to work with in, in these hyper growth scenarios. Like what have you taken away from this and what advice do you have to anyone who's running a business that's growing quickly and they're just trying to hold on? Right. Two, two very good questions. I mean, I think on the on the CEO front, obviously it's fairly interesting for me to get offered a job as a CEO. I think it's very, much more common in Silicon Valley for founders to run their companies. And, you know, we just had this very unique situation where um, the, the product was sort of not born by mistake, but you know what I mean? It was a pivot and it wasn't necessarily the strong suit or, or where, the, where the founders wanted to be um, applying their time and it was taking off and there was all these things that came together very magically, I think for that. Um, but I think in general, like, I, I think it pays to differentiate between consumer and B2B as well. I think if you want to be CEO of a consumer technology company, um, it's, it's, to me, it's kind of a crapshoot. I'm sure other people don't view it that way, but it's like, you have to have an insight into what the world wants and it has to be, it's typically very opinionated and um a lot of failure you know Mm -hmm. one in however many companies actually make it because that founder ceo said i think the world needs this phenomenon that doesn't exist today let's go chase it everyone thinks they're crazy you know and they turn out to be the ones that are correct i think it's very Mm -hmm. hard to um like sort of control for that like i I think either either you're that person and there's something you want to see in the world or, or or you're not necessarily i think you know b2b can be a little different where um, there is sort of a predictable march forward of technology and the technology platforms that are available to businesses and and that allow them to serve their customers better. And so for us, and I think for most B2B software companies, it's really a question of having a thesis about what the future looks like and having a vision for for some, some broader uh, phenomenon, but also just being very diligent about really understanding customer problems and really listening to customer problems and solving those problems. And if you can solve, if you can understand a problem, solve it using software, and then communicate to the person who had the problem that you've solved it and that they should trust you as the person who solved it, you've basically won. So you're just repeating that process over and over. And I think for me, at least, there was a lot of value in having worked in sales and worked in um, the business side of things, but also having spent a lot of time thinking about product development and, you know, uh, and, and kind of going deeper than maybe is expected on, on both sides. I think, you know, being really good at both things, um, if to the greatest extent possible, not to suggest that I am, but to the greatest extent possible being really good. Um, that's going to allow you to understand the problem the customer is having, 
solve it in a in an effective and somewhat novel way and then communicate back to them hey i've solved this problem and i think you should trust me to be the person who provides the solution and so i do think it's a lot more formulaic uh but um it does require you know quite a lot of um i guess diverse expertise and then you also have to be willing to be the person who says i'm going to go and hire however many people that i need to hire to make this thing true and this this i think is the hardest part by far is um, I have enough faith in myself and the and the way that I'm solving this problem that uh, I can be. I feel like I can trust myself to to actually um, take these people and have them spend all this time on it and and know that I'm going to deliver the best result for all of us as a team. I think that actually is the takes the most guts. Uh, you really have to believe in what you're doing. I think in order to um, not just convince people to join you because I hate that idea, but to be able to very truthfully bring people along on a journey and say, Hey, we're going to go solve a problem and it's going to work out for all of us. So I think that, uh, and that's a total, like, you know, totally different, uh, kettle of fish, as they say. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it is something too, that I think it really hits at something fundamental is, is, you know, people often, I think just casually think, Oh, if you're the CEO, you're the boss and you're not beholden to as many people when in truth, you're beholden to more than Everyone. anybody. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I feel very fortunate. Like, you know, I was at Twilio and I think Twilio CEO Jeff Lawson is like an unbelievable modern tech CEO. So I, I do feel as though, yeah, that was super inspiring um, for me in a lot of ways. Uh, but it's a it's a hard job. It's a, it's a really hard job. Yeah, no doubt. Well, Evan, thank you so much. We're out of time, but thank you so much for sharing this with us. I had a great time talking with you, and I think our, our audience uh, has has learned a lot today and, is, and has enjoyed the show. So thank you for being on. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for watching or listening today. You'll find more information in the show notes. Please remember to follow Data Leadership Lessons on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. If you enjoy the show, please rate and review and tell others about us. Learn more about data leadership with my book at dataleadershipbook.com and use promo code AugmanDL at the Dataversity Online Training Center for 20% off your first purchase. Stay safe during these unusual times and go make an impact. 